everyone. Welcome to Risk Roundup. When the wireless technology industry moves at the speed of light, what will be its impact to the existing and emerging initiatives in cyberspace, geospace, and space? Of the many initiatives that will be impacted across cyberspace, geospace, and space, the impact on wearables is expected to be profound. From fitness trackers to smartwatches, smart glasses to health trackers, wearable technology today is rapidly moving towards a tomorrow of not only efficiency, affordability, and functionality, but also speed and size that is fundamental to support tracking and other desired functions. As the potential of variables is likely to lead us to a future of countless possibilities, it is important to evaluate which advances in technology are empowering variables to collectively become faster, smaller, smarter, and effective. To discuss the future of variables technology promise further, I am delighted to welcome Dan Lager to Risk Roundup. Dan is the founder of Path Collaborative and is based in the United States. Welcome, Dan. We are honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Wonderful, Dan. So the future of wearables technology promise is almost here. What advances in technology do you think are empowering wearables to become faster, smaller, smarter, and effective simultaneously? Yeah, it's it's a fantastic question. I think um, it's funny when you look at the news today, uh, you see a lot of inference to the fact that, you know, we just came through this bubble is exiting the wearable space this year. We've seen a lot of high profile exits. Uh, we see a lot of companies struggling in the space now because 2014 and 2015 were really a, a sort of a first bubble in the space with activity trackers and smartwatches. And it has a lot of people wondering, you know, it was wearable sort of a fad. Is this, you know, is this the beginning of something bigger? And I think for all of us who, who work in this space, you know, we are still very much in the, in the early days of, of uh, wearable technology. And when we look at the advances that we see right now in battery technology, non-invasive sensor technology, artificial intelligence, uh, it's not hard to imagine all of the various benefits that this technology will, will help with down the road. And I think particularly, you know, we see, we see applications um, in productivity and security and, and uh, entertainment, but I think human health and enhancement of human performance are going to be two of the areas that are going to be most most profoundly affected. And and within that, I think uh, in particular is uh, chronic disease, which you know, today in the U.S. we spend upwards of three trillion dollars uh, in healthcare, and more than eighty five percent of that goes to treating people with chronic diseases. So there is a a massive economic and social case. Uh, around prevention of, where, of, of chronic diseases and, and wearable technology along with the right layers of incentives and behavior change are proving to be a very new tool in that fight that have uh, very meaningful, uh, ec the potential to have very meaningful economic impact. So I continue to be very excited and inspired by this market. Uh, you know, I've, for the last eight or nine years, I've focused on a lot of things, but I've chosen to focus on this in particular because I believe in the massive social and economic impact that wearable technology will eventually have. Uh, so it's, it, it, and, and we really are in the early days of things right now. Yes, very true. And you are absolutely right about that. It's the collective advances in the technology like AI and internet of things and sensors and all that, that has, taken the variables to the next level and also the advances from 4G to 5G and now probably towards Li-Fi, all these, you know, collectively, it gives us an ability to have the real-time data. And that is, you know, perhaps the transformational factor and it is uh, taking the variables to all new height, you know, the whole new ecosystem that is developing. It, it is just uh, very fascinating and exciting to see what kind of capabilities and potential it's going to give us. Now, it seems wearable technology has moved far beyond fitness trackers and is perhaps one of the... Are you hearing some echo? I am not. Okay, sorry. So it's okay. the wearable technology has moved far beyond fitness trackers and is perhaps 
one of the fastest growing sectors which is expected to grow to hundreds of billions uh, of dollars worth of market in the coming years now while the future of wearable technology seems strong where do you see it going what kind of ecosystem you see that is going to develop yeah no it's a great question you know the, i think the first question is really how you def, you know define the space um because when we think about wearable technology in, in, the, in a modern context, you know, we think mostly about smart connected devices. Um, and, and there are a number of sort of concentric circles. You can think of a hearing aid as a, a wearable device or a, an insulin pump as a wearable device as well. But uh, I think when we really look at the core of this market, which really is connected devices, as you mentioned, wireless devices which have, uh, may or may not have sensors which have wireless connectivity to the cloud, um, certainly, uh, activity tracking and smartwatches have been re the real sort of core of this space. And, uh, you know, what excites me now is, you know, while that space has begun to saturate a little bit and has begun to run into some, some technological barriers, which we can talk about, uh, there are a lot of other applications that are springing up around the fringe. You know, we see a lot more happening around niche, more niche use cases, be it uh, for populations of users, for children or the elderly or the pets or the disabled. We see, we see categories of devices popping up around specific kinds of uh, conditions. Uh, we see devices popping up to treat things like chronic pain and migraines. We see products popping up now that, for, for very, uh, that are much more application specific, swimming, golf, and things like that. So while we, we still have this very sort of strong core of this smart wearable market, we're also seeing companies begin to uh, bring technologies together into all these other very interesting use cases. And that is what I think we're going to see in the next five or 10 years when we look back. Uh, you know, certainly fitness trackers and smartwatches will have their place in history and will continue to evolve. But it's all of these other sort of seeds that are being planted, very innovative startups that are going to grow into sort of the next generation of what the space becomes. Yes. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be a better smartwatch. It's going to be, in some cases, things that we look back on and say, how do we not see that coming? Uh, how do we not see the opportunity to, to rearrange those sensors and, and apply them, which is a much better application than, for example, something on your wrist? Yes. Uh, so, so what excites me is just constantly seeing new companies sort of pushing the envelope with, with creativity imagination and just you know there are a lot of state-of-the-art technologies to really push the envelope yes very true and you are right that there are a lot of new innovators and new startups that are you know popping up everywhere i mean based on your observation which startup seems to be very promising and who seems to be the top players in wearables today if we talk about united states yeah, it's a great question you know when we look at when we look at sort of the traditional smart wearables today, I mean, obviously, uh, Apple, Fitbit, uh, Xiaomi are the, you know, remain the lar the largest player in space. Um, you know, Apple, uh, Fitbit, for example, recently uh, stated in their quarterly investor uh, call a few weeks ago that their Fitbit Blaze last quarter outsold all of the Android Wear devices in North America, just to give you a sense of of the success they've had in their in their platform. Um, on, on the other hand, you know, we've seen uh, high profile players like HTC and Motorola announce that they're no longer playing in the space because it's too hard, you know, it's too difficult. The, uh, you know, it, it, it remains a very difficult market. It remains a, a, a market that has a lot of fluctuation to it's very capital intensive, but there are a few companies out there that that, that um, excite me. There's a company here in Boston called uh, Neurometrics that, uh, that builds a, a calf band that's designed to treat chronic pain, and it's an alternative to opioid-based treatments. Uh, and they've, they've gone through FDA approval. They've, they've had a number of very sort of promising uh, results with that. And I think that's a great example of people taking a big step back and saying, you know, there are physiology that that may not be obvious to, to the average person on the street but we found a clever way to stimulate this nerve in the calf that has that that uh that has been shown to sort of reduce chronic pain 
Uh, there's companies doing sort of the same thing with migraine headaches, for example. Um, I'm looking over here because I have a little list of, of, of some of the companies that I sort of have found interesting over the years. Um, uh, Spire, Spire.io is a company that a clip that is designed to help people manage stress. So it monitors your breathing rate, sort of a gentle haptic nudge when you're in a, in a state of sort of high arousal and it, it helps to sort of train you to sort of better manage your stress. Uh, there's a company called um, this, uh, the Muse Headband, which is designed to help people with mindfulness and meditation. It's uh, an EEG band that measures your brain waves while you meditate to help keep you in a state of concentration. So it's things like this. It's companies that are taking a combination of biosensing, data processing, uh, and wrapping that up into a, an interesting form factor and solving interesting use cases. And I think one of the, you know, when I look back on this, on this space two or three years ago, everyone was talking about the data. You know, if we, if we could just get more data, then we could, we could monetize the data. And there are a bunch of companies that, that their, their whole model was just trying to collect data. And I think what we've learned is that while data is important, you know, what, what trumps that for users in particular is just a benefit. You know, finding something that, that translates to a benefit. You know, when, when it comes to activity trackers, people aren't necessarily interested in how many steps they walk. You know, they're interested in having this device that's acting like a cheerleader for them, that's helping them get to the next level in terms of weight loss or fitness and things like that. And so I, I've always been sort of drawn to companies that are starting with a really human problem. You know, people who des desire to, to live a healthier life or lose weight or have more security when they're walking alone at night or, or manage chronic pain. And companies that start with these sort of timeless human needs and work backwards, I think are the ones that are gonna be ultimately the most successful. I think companies that have struggled have been, you know, some of the models which have been purely centered around gathering data and presenting that data to users. I think that model inherently is limited because in a lot of cases, users don't really know what to do with that data because we don't know a lot about how our bodies work, right? Most, most of us have a fairly low health literacy. And, and, and the metaphor I like to use is it's like as if there's a new gauge that popped up on your car's dashboard. And you knew you didn't want to get it too high and you knew it wasn't supposed to go too low. But panic, I'm not really sure what that's telling me. You really need someone there to kind of translate the data into information. Very true. Very true. No, th that, those guide you through the process. Yes, very true. And those examples that you gave are so welcoming. I mean, to be able to manage the stress or uh, pain, migraine pain or uh, opioid crisis, that would be very welcoming if they are able to bring effective solutions uh, through variables. And uh, you, you are absolutely right about that. You know, we don't want just uh, tracking the steps that we walked and all that. We want some meaningful uh, benefit of that and the future of variable tech. Uh, technology lies in the practical use of all these everyday scenarios that you just mentioned and the fact that we can uh, carry everything with us for our safety for our you know benefit for our defense uh, is very welcoming and if you look at the current trends it seems that the technology is heading towards a software defined sensor platform where more features applications can be unveiled with software updates so it's not that you buy a variable once and then you just have to dispose it off we will be able to update and add more features you know add uh, through the uh, this uh, applications so i think that is going to uh, fundamentally transform what kind of applications or features the variable market or the variable ecosystem could have where do you see the impact on uh, because the ability to have the uh, features application to be unveiled with software updates? What kind of impact do you see on variables because of this? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, one of the models that I think is, is emerging, particularly with Fitbit and, and Apple, is, you know, giving developers access to bio data and allowing them to find ways to sort of an experience that is enhanced beyond the native experience of an Apple Watch or a Fitbit Ionic. Uh, and I think that that is going to open up some really interesting possibilities uh, as, as, as developer, certain kinds of developers uh, get access to that health and find, um, find more, more interesting ways to sort of create value for users in, in, in more interesting niche use cases.
Um, you know, if it's, if it's measuring arousal or measuring stress or if it's helping people enhance their workouts, uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how Apple and Fitbit in particular um, mobilize their developer ecosystems in the years to come and, and use them as a way to unlock more of these capabilities. You know, one, one of the interesting things about this market is, you know, while we hear a lot about sensors, you know, particularly in IoT, you know, like the, the sensors at the edge and all of these developments and sensors, when it comes to wearables, you know, all of the sensors are what are called non-invasive sensors, meaning they, they sit outside your body and they, they you know, use light or, or, or measurements of electrical potential to try to figure out what's going on inside your body. Uh, and the challenge is, is that it's really hard. Uh, it's really hard to do non-invasive sensing reliably. And, and what we've seen is that, you know, the industry has fairly reliably gotten to a point where we can measure heart rate for, for people across a lot of different body compositions and skin types. But there are a lot of other types of physiological measurements that are really hard to do from the outside. You know, if we wanted to measure uh, stress or, or the presence of a hormone in the blood, uh, that's really hard to do. And, and the metaphor I like to use is if you've ever gone to a, a movie theater complex and you're walking down the hallway to your theater, you may hear a rumble from the theater door that you're passing and, and you think to yourself, you know, is that an action movie or is it a love story? All I heard was a rumble and, and the sensors on our body have sort of the same problem. You know, when we're trying to measure emotion or stress or some of these more interesting sort of physiological states, uh, the sensor alone is very limited in what it, what it gathers. And there's this huge data puzzle that exists in terms of finding the remaining context to put together a story and doing that accurately. And so, so what we've seen in the industry now is, you know, here we are in 2017 and, and we see these new products coming out that don't look that different from the products we saw in 2014 when we first started seeing heart rate coming into wearable devices. You know, we, I mean, they've gotten a little smaller. They, the, the heart rate sensing has gotten better. But uh, in a way, we've been sort of stalled out as an industry because reliably getting to those higher order insights across populations is a huge challenge. And a lot of people say, well, you know, maybe this is just sort of a machine learning problem. You know, maybe we just need better algorithms and things like that. But the problem is, is that we just don't have enough of the data, the contextual data to fill in the missing gaps such that this works for, if you have a million users, that this works for, you know, 99 and a half percent of them. Um, and that's been a big challenge. And I think that's something that uh, the people who are ultimately going to solve it are those who are thinking radically differently about how sensors should be used and arranged in the body or people who are out there building these really interesting data partnerships and saying, you know, we can gather this physiological data. What other pieces of the data puzzle would we need to put together to understand if the kind of arousal you're experiencing is negative stress or positive happiness? You know, are you, are you laughing or are you having a stressful phone call? They kind of look the same to our sensor. So, um, we are in this period right now of um, waiting for certain pieces of the technology ecosystem to mature to a point uh, before, you know, as, as we, we begin to unlock this next level of use cases that are out there. Yes, Getting right. to see early signs of that happening, and I think this is going to usher in sort of, you know, this wearables 2.0 era that will be far more diverse, far more creative. Um, than what we've seen with just activity trackers and smartwatches. That is a, that's an excellent analysis that you gave about the potential use of the sensors because the true potential of wearable space that is evolving in front of us, it's not in having the you know, smartwatches or uh, trackers or Fitbits, but the new and interesting sensors that could be incorporated and there are new so many new sensors that are you know being developed for all different kinds of you know applications and when we have all these new sensors it means new data new uh, the and the uh, each new data that we can get it means new insights into all the applicability of those insights into markets, which industries we can target, what kind of problems we can solve by having that particular data. So the ability to have these 
sensors in on the person on human beings or inside the human beings these will ignite so many different and diverse ecosystems the same way probably that uh, when we had the gps uh, navigation you know uh, ability that came our way and then so many new different applications and potential came uh, that just proved to be amazing so i think we are on to something with this ability to have these new sensor data iot's and uh, the ability to minimize it and to have it at a very effective speed that just brings a whole new potential so uh, you you mentioned a really interesting example about the behavior or whether when someone is talking on the phone whether that person is uh, getting stressed out he's happy or he's sad or angry do you have any data on if we have that kind of uh, sensor capabilities that can change uh, that can track or identify the behavioral health issues yeah i mean when when it comes to things like stress you know there there are uh, a number of of companies out there like first beat that that build algorithms that um you know using heart rate variability or your skin conductance uh to 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 measure a perceived level of arousal um and it's 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 interesting because it, it it's kind of one of those car gauges i described before you know i i wear a a Garmin uh, Vivo Smart 3 which is one of the first you know one of the first products I've used that actually measures stress and it's still one of those things that that constantly perplexes me I I'll be feeling relaxed and I'll look down and it will say stressed out right now and your stress level is high I'll say oh that's that's interesting or I'll be I'll feel a little stressed and I'll look down and my oh so it's really about taking that data helping a lay user like myself Self and probably most people out there connect that into the kind of outcomes that I care about. I live a stressful life and I'm trying to sleep better or cut down the stress. There's this middle layer there that's needed in all of these applications that we talked a little bit about before that translates this data and information, knowledge and wisdom that I can then use to, to make certain changes in my life. Right? And that's you know, that is another one of these gaps. There's a lot of data out there, and, and some companies are successful of getting into the information, but user gap of like, what do I do with that? You know, some people use the word actionable. I think of it more as um, net requisite layer of almost coaching, if you will. If you know, I'm, if you know what my goals are, if you are my coach, you have this information, tell me what to do. You know, and, and that is here in 2017, you know, one of the big focuses this year that I've seen is, is the emergence of these sort of AI-based coaching platforms. Um, you know, there's a, a, a company called Lifebeam that makes these headphones called the uh, VIV. And I actually have a pair, of, you know, I use them, I'm a runner and I have a pair of them right here. And it's, it's basically an AI coach um, that has access to your, your heart rate and your, your cadence and whatnot and is actually coaching you while you're running. And I, I've learned so much as a runner from w wearing these that I never got from a running watch before. A running watch tells me my stride and my pace, and, uh, but it, it, it doesn't make me a better runner. Yes. You know? And so, so I think what, what we're really seeing in this next wave of products is the importance of using AI and coaching to, to make these experiences much more human, um, much more like, I understand your goals. I'm going to help you get there versus I am a device on your wrist that's going to give you data. But in, and it's then your responsibility to figure out what you want to do with that data. Yes, you are right. That and that would be so amazing to have an affordable coach, AI coach with you all the time, because how many people can afford trainers? So this would be really, it's like having trainer with you all the time. And it could be training about any aspect of your life, about mm -hmm. your, you know, jogging or about your getting healthy or eating habits or even at workplace, how to stay calm or, you know, so all kinds of possibilities are there. So I'm really glad to hear that, you know, there are very good advances happening in that uh, sector. But compared to looking at that, when you look, evaluate that, what other, what industries do you see that has a potential of changing because of that ability to have that kind mm -hmm. of uh, uh, training, AI-based uh, trainer with you all the time or coach all the time? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. I think that um, when, when we look out at, at the applications of, of wearable technology and in, in this in particular, because I think, you know, be, you know, helping people change behaviors through coaching and the right incentives, you know, offers some of the largest, I think, payback. And this, again, gets back to what we talked about earlier with chronic disease. Um, so I think certainly in, in, when we think about population health and health care, I think what we've learned and what a growing number of studies and programs have shown us over the last few years is that when you take uh, an activity tracker and, and uh, you take that and you wrap around it the right incentives, the right coaching, the right support, the right information for people, you can affect really meaningful lifestyle change in their lives, which is great. So you take people who you know, maybe are a little older who have never exercised in their life. And, and with the right layers of incentives and, and again, coaching and, and uh, tracking, uh, you know, you, you see people make these, these fairly profound lifestyle changes. I think, you know, Fitbit does a nice job of, of talking about people in their network, you know, their, their users who have, uh, for whom these devices have been transformative. I talk to a lot of people anecdotally who, you know, said, oh yeah, you know, I've, you know, I, I got a Fitbit and I lost 50 pounds. I, I talked to a lot of physicians and what one physician was telling me, he's like, I've seen this patient for 20 years and every year he, he somehow manages to gain five or 10 pounds. And this one year he came to my office, I walked into my office and there was this, this man, thin man wearing a tank top. And uh, the guy, since I had seen him last, he had lost like 150 pounds. And he's like, I got any, he, he's like, I got a Fitbit. You know, and that's what it was. And it, you know, Fitbits don't work for everyone. You, you really need to be in the right kind of uh, state of mind from a behavior change perspective. There's some people out there who, you know, for whom they'll get a Fitbit and they will throw it in a drawer and they'll never wear it. You know, and that's and that's fine, and that's that's part of the population. But there are a lot of other people for whom uh, those kinds of products are really great medicine. And it's not really the tracking that's so great. It's the fact that you have this like wrist that's giving you this positive feedback and positive support. Yes. You know, the step count happens to be part of that, but um, uh, it, it, what is really meaningful for the, those populations is just the, the, the positive feedback and the support they get from their friends and their network. Very true, very uh, true. It's a like motivator, motivation, you know, they get and exactly. constant feedback. Yeah. Talking, but, but you mentioned about, uh, see, that exercise and tracking and uh, taking steps is one thing, but see, the ability to manage stress, I think if we are able to create an application using uh, AI-based, uh, some sort of, you know, coach that will help you manage stress no matter where you are, whether you are at home or in gym or whether you are at workplaces or whether you are in some social circles, because that's where I think, you know, or in college dorms, you know, there's so much stress everywhere. There is not a single place in a single location or single profession that is without stress. And not everyone is able to do any something about it. Not everyone is uh, thinking of going to psychologists or getting some therapy or some getting to counselors. It just is not happening. There are many factors because of for that because they people don't want to go, don't want to go and talk about their problems. But if we have this kind of AI based coach in a variable format with you 24 seven, it will bring such a fundamental transformation in how we manage our stress level. It will be so, so, you know, it, it is going to bring so much benefit to each and every individual. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you talked about those variables, are those variables uh, developed at a stage where we can commercialize that? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a great point. There's, there's I think, um, when we think about uh, maybe mental health broadly, two, two areas that I think are particularly uh, right right now are stress and sleep. And if you look what's going on in, in corporate wellness, for example, you know, corporate wellness is basically, you know, most of large companies in the US self insure themselves, uh, they take on a lot of the risk of their employees. And so they're incentivized to find programs to help, you know, make their employees healthier, you know, live longer, happier lives. And for, 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 you know, many years, those a lot of those programs were focused on uh, diet and exercise. Over the last few years, there's been this 
you know, uh, increase in focus, uh, not only on physical health, but also on sort of mental health and financial health, because, you know, companies realize that if all three of those aren't in place, then all three of them suffer. You know, you can have someone who, for example, is in great physical health, but has sleeps very poorly and, you know, the, the, their productivity suffers, their absenteeism suffers. So, so stress and sleep right now are getting a lot more focus, uh, uh, particularly from companies who, who, who are rolling out a lot of these wellness programs. What's interesting about stress is that, you know, there's, there's, there's two sides of the, the sort of the, the stress coin. There's helping people reduce the amount of stress in their day. You know, MBSR programs do. It helps people kind of rewire their reactions. And then there's also uh, teaching people uh, stress resilience. And this is what, you know, the, the, the army does. And, and there's this kind of this growing interest in programs that help people acknowledging that, you know, we're going to continue to have a lot of stress in our day and our lives. And rather than trying to avoid that stress, it's, it's really teaching people how to cope with stress uh, and, and learn how, how to avoid the, the, um, uh, you know, the, the extreme physiological response and, and train your body in a way to remain calm under pressure. And so there's a huge amount of uh, work going on there. And while sensors are a big piece of that, because people need feedback to, to understand when they're, they're getting aroused and as they're training, this is another area where, where human coaches and, and potentially AI coaches uh, will have a, a big impact in the long term. But you're right, I think, you know, stress. And then there's one of my, one of my other favorite companies is Ura. Ura makes a ring. I think is kind of like a, a great example of what is possible in the state of the art of the art in terms of miniaturization, that they make a ring that monitors sleep and helps assess your readiness for the day to, to manage your energy levels. Uh, and that's an, you know, that's another uh, kind of product that helps people learn how to sleep better. Uh, you know, you can learn different triggers in your life that, that cause ex excess fatigue or, or, or reduce your, your, mental or physical readiness uh, in your day. So I think maybe to answer your question more succinctly, you know, we are seeing companies like Ura and First Beat and, and others uh, begin to make some really interesting breakthroughs and bring products to market here. And I think this is going to be a huge area of focus, particularly over the next five years. Yes. Yes, it would be very welcoming and it would be very, very beneficial to each and every individual across nation. I mean, we're not just talking about United States, but pretty much in every nation, mm -hmm. you know, people are going to benefit because of this. The stress levels are high. People don't know how to manage the stress, how to they don't know what to do to come out of the stress or like you said, you know, get resilient to the stress. Uh, we, there is never going to be a life where the stress is not there. But how to effectively be resilient, that's what, you know, we uh, should be focusing on. And if there are companies like uh, you just mentioned that are working towards that, though, that is going to be so welcoming and so transformational. Now, let's talk about the other industries. We talked enough about the behavioral health, mental health issues and uh, where we can, you know, walk away with having a really very strong future of variables where it would benefit every individual, every citizen can benefit. But now let's talk about the variables that can benefit the employers in the workplace. Variable technology is poised to explore in the workplace. That's what all the signs are pointing to. And it's potentially significant impact. It will bring very significant impact on the economy because variables are already leveraging advances in voice technology, biometrics, and communications. And they are just growing very rapidly. How do you see workplaces changing because of these variables? I lost you for a minute. Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, uh, uh, Were you hear the question? Yeah, would you mind starting that one over? Sure. Uh, the variable technology is poised to explode in the workplace. Uh, there are all signs that points towards that and it's going to have a very significant impact on the economy and the variables if we see they're already leveraging advances in voice technology biometrics communications uh, and the instant you know data feedback so this is growing very rapidly how do you see all these advances in all this technology and the variables changing the workplace yeah it's 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 another it's a great question and i think that it's uh 
you're right that there's a lot of, of really interesting application there. You know, when we think about, I, I tend to sort of think of the world in, in, in two parts when we think about uh, the enterprise broadly. There are people who sit at a desk most of the day, and then there are what are called deskless workers. You know, people who are uh, on their feet most of the day. Uh, examples of deskless workers could be a surgeon, uh, a field technician, uh, a warehouse picker, um, uh, someone who works on an assembly line. Uh, and so when we think about the, the, the desk worker, uh, you know, even things like an Apple Watch, which just make you, you know, attempt to make you more productive. And I think that's kind of, there's still some debate about uh, whether or not constant interruptions on your wrist improve or, or, or degrade your productivity. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of applications now that, you know, a lot of enterprise applications have extended onto the smartwatch as almost like a second screen. You know, you've got your, smart, your, your, your smartphone as a primary screen and you've got a smartwatch as a second screen. Um, but, and, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll see, uh, continue to see interesting sort of examples of productivity enhancement there. But I think it's really when we get it to, to the deskless worker uh, where we see a lot of the more interesting use cases coming up. Um, you know, we've seen over the last decade, uh, a, a, a sharp increase in the use of body cameras by, by police officers, which is, I think, one great example. Uh, one of the areas that AR glasses are getting a lot of traction in is the deskless worker community. So while when Google Glass first came out, it, you know, it had a lot of very mixed consumer reactions, but, uh, you know, quietly a lot of, uh, uh, enterprise opportunities emerged and there are companies like APX Labs that built software layers and there's companies like Epson and View6 and Google that make AR glasses and this is you know imagine like a field technician who's out at a remote uh, panel who has a, a field of view camera and a heads-up display uh, getting support from a home office as they're you know working on a piece of remote equipment um, a warehouse picker, you know, let's say you are a large uh, online retailer and you have warehouses that are a million square feet and you have these people walking around the warehouse with, with, with um, you know, AR glasses instead of handheld scanners, you know, that's a, a, an interesting efficiency gain. Um, you know, doctors or, or uh, uh, assembly line workers who have a heads up display that have information and context about what they're doing so they don't have to refer to a piece of documentation or even a tablet. Uh, so there's a lot there. Uh, there's a lot happening around occupational safety. You know, uh, uh, field workers, you know, they're, they're what are called like man down solutions. So someone has a device that can detect if uh, a, lo a lone worker who's out working on a power line has, has been injured, is moving. Can radio for help on their behalf. Um, so there are all of these really interesting applications that that help people, that help keep workers safe, and help uh, make workers more productive when both of their hands are being used for other things, uh, which is commonly the case with deskless workers. So I think that is really the you know the area that um, likely you see a lot of the really interesting growth. Uh, you know, certainly on the enterprise, I, there are a lot of mobile apps that have extended onto the smartwatch that, you know, could be considered enterprise wearables applications, but I don't think they're, the, the benefit is nearly as deep as we're seeing it uh, for, for more of the deskless community and population out there. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, maybe, maybe one other way to think about the industry is that, you know, we have people who go out and they buy wearable devices for themselves. Uh, mostly consumers, and then we have groups that go out and buy wearable devices for their employees, mm. might be uh, to the company's benefit or to the employee's benefit. So, uh, you know, this is, you know, again, where we see things like corporate wellness programs coming in place. You know, a year or two ago, Target bought 350,000 Fitbits for, for their employees. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so programs like that aimed at keeping employee populations healthy and you know, delaying the onset of chronic disease as long as possible, in many cases.
Very true. Very true. And each insurance, I mean, each industry is going to benefit from these uh, kind of, you know, developments. I think insurance industries now offer lower premiums. If you wear those kind of trackable devices, Fitbits, and uh, if they see that you are constantly active and, you know, you're working towards wellness and health, and then you have to pay lower premiums. So there are great benefits, great advantages, but uh, there's some, some developments that are happening that are really very exciting for, I think Google is working on developing magnetic nanoparticles that are capable of seeking out cancerous cells in the bloodstream and uh, uh, these kind of nanotech powered variables uh, i'm not sure if we are close to reality but if we are able to pull through this and manipulating substance on the atomic and molecular level it could provide us a entirely new host of wearable technology capabilities mm -hmm. uh, do you see nanotech power variables uh, possibility in near future? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there, there are two there are two kind of categories of wearables that um, you know. I, again, I don't I don't know if they, I would necessarily call them wearables anymore, but they're they're ingestible devices yes. uh, and in, in, injectables and and then implantables, things that we we put under our skin. I was at the uh, the Wear conference in San Francisco a month than a half ago or two months ago. And at the conference, they did a live uh, where implant of an RFID device on a volunteer who was there. And they, they implanted this device under the skin by her thumb, which was kind of a, I, I had not seen that in the, in, in the, in the uh, agenda. And I was quite taken to watch this medical procedure take place in a, a hotel ballroom. But it was really neat, the fact that, you know, they have these devices now that are about the size of a grain of rice that you can uh, just inject underneath the skin of your, uh, between your thumb and your forefinger. Uh, and uh, anyone who's a jeweler is qualified to do this. And it, you know, you can open up smart locks. So you can, you, you can, you can store the keys to your home or uh, you know, other smart locks you have in your life. So you no longer need to bring a wallet or a, a key card with you or a fob. Um, so so it, I think in the short term, there are a number of really neat applications like that. Uh, or patches and stickers. Um, there's a company called, uh, um, I think it's uh, Proteus that has a, a, a pill that you smaller than a grain of you know, pass through your body and gathers a bunch of vitals and you have a wearable device that, that kind of picks up, it's a patch that picks up the signal from this tiny little device that's going to digestive system. So we see stuff like that that is FDA approved that's on the market today. When we start getting into nanotechnology and nanorobots and, and um, you know, uh, uh, contact lenses and things like that, you know, that stuff has a time horizon that may be like three years away or 30 years away or 100 years away. Uh, <laughs> so there is, I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things you look at, like, you know, it's going to be really neat when we get there, but it's, Yes, yes. There's still a lot to figure out in those. Right. Years. Yes, very true. And I mean, You're right, there is, um, you know, getting inside the body is is much better in terms of understanding what's going on. It's like getting into the movie theater. Yes. Through the door and trying to ascertain what's going on inside. You know what the plot of the movie is. So. Very true. Um, I think when we find ways to do invasive sensing a little bit more. Uh, in, in a way that's a little bit more palatable for consumers other than having people prick themselves and draw their own blood. Uh, you know, I think that's also going to open up a, a lot of interesting applications. You know, for example, there's a company that uses nano needles, you know, that kind of press up against your skin. Uh, you, you know, it doesn't necessarily cause discomfort, but it gets through the skin and into sort of the, um, analyze uh, blood and body chemistry. Uh, subcutaneously. So, so, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of need innovation there as well over the next sort of decade. Great. That those are all really welcoming innovations. And if we look, if we talk about the applications of all these advances in wearables and other technologies, there is 
so many so much happening for each and every industry and it would take probably you know an hour for each individual industry so we are now we won't be able to address all those advances or applications of variables uh, industry specific let's talk a little bit about the challenges that this industry is facing the variables because a lot of people say that for variables uh, there needs to be innovation in battery to to be able to succeed in the coming years the way we would like it to you know succeed because the battery of variables doesn't last you know long enough and it, it, that a lot of people are saying a lot of analysts and there is a growing you know feeling that unless we solve that problem then we are not going to have an effective use of uh, the variables what what advances or what developments do you see to overcome mm. this uh, power challenge that we are facing no, no, yeah, it's a great question. You're, you're right in that, um, you know, battery tech, the, the complaint across all of portable electronics industries is that battery technology has really failed to keep up with uh, the rest of, of, uh, of technology. Uh, I think in the case of wearables, two, two things are kind of happening to mitigate the, uh, slow, the, you know, the slower than, than desired progress in batteries. Uh, the first is that we're seeing... Uh, the emergence of a, su a component supply chain designed for wearable devices. You know, when wearables first emerged, we borrowed components from the smartphone supply chain. You know, we borrowed accelerometers and, and whatnot. And now a number of semiconductor companies are now providing ultra low power, you know, very small form factor accelerometers, microprocessors, and things like that. So while, you know, the battery capacity maybe hasn't gone up very much, the amount of energy and power that these chips use has gone down quite a bit, which is why, you know, uh, you know, I had a basis B1 watch that had, you know, a battery life of a day or two that did continuous heart rate monitoring. So it's basically shining a light into your skin all the time. And uh, I have a, you know, this Garmin Vivo Smart 3, you know, it has a much better battery life. You know, it probably has a smaller battery, but, because the components have gotten so much more power efficient, uh, batteries last longer. So that's been one, one thing that's been really nice. Uh, the other thing that's starting to happen is we're seeing uh, begin to use energy harvesting in wearable devices. So there's a, a, a watch that just came out, um, and I'm not sure if they're shipping yet, uh, and I out of it here. Hold on one second as I look at my notes on my cheat sheet here. Um, <laughs> but that, that uses the thermal gradient on your wrist, like the difference in temperature from your wrist to the ambient air, uh, uh, to harvest energy. And it harvests enough energy to power the watch. It's a, it's a basic smartwatch. Um, of course, I can't find it on my sheet here. But um, uh, it's a basic smartwatch, and it, it does notifications and things like that. And, and you never have to charge it. That would be really welcoming. Not between have to charge. And uh, we've really managed to sort of mitigate a lot of the uh, negative consequences of, of lab improvements in battery technology. The, the devices that still suffer most are the devices that have active displays, you know, like a, an Apple Watch or, or a Fitbit Blaze where, you know, the display lights up. You know, we, we've managed to cut a lot of power out of that, but, but they, they still are a fairly power intensive part of the system. And, uh, you know, most people want something that's on all the time so that they can glance and look what time it is. They don't necessarily have to want to, you know, activate the display. And that's why we're still sort of locked into this world of, you know, for a lot of smartwatch experiences, um, you know, kind of 24 hour battery life. You know, you charge it at night with your phone kind of experience. Um, and so I think that that section of the industry in particular has been the hardest hit uh, by the lack of improvements in battery technology because they're the ones who use the most sort of the most energy in the course of the day. Yes, yes. Yes, but you are, you're right. There are a lot of advances happening in this sector and uh, there is very promising technologies coming from MIT and from, you know, also other uh, labs. So hopefully we'll be able to overcome that in the very near future so that we can have effective uh, use of this technology without having to, you know, uh, charge it or power it, you know, every now and then. Now let's talk about security uh, because as the digital global age advances at a rapid pace and all these uh, amazing IOTs in, and uh, uh, 
variables and smart cars and smart homes and smart cities and smart enterprises everything uh, that is you know emerging they all demand rapid global network access to gain the new momentum and in variable ecosystem also security is a necessary enabler for continuity of the initiative or business or you know or any personal or professional uh, initiative that is going on and we are still struggling with managing computer and network security risk in cyberspace variables is so much more complex what what are your thoughts about uh, you know where we stand on managing the emerging variable security risk yeah it's it's a good question so you know there's been a lot of discussion about both security and privacy which are you know often lumped together in the same bucket but but two very different and very interesting discussions you know when it comes to security um, if, if someone you know, stole data from my, my step data from my Fitbit, you know, uh, th there's, there's not a lot they could really do with that. You know, there's, you know, the, the, the kind of data that wearables generate today, uh, I, I think is lower value data in the hierarchy of stuff that you know, medical records have a lot more value than, uh, some guys, uh, Fitbit data from a couple weeks. Um, with that said though, there are uh, so, so, and as as sensors improve and we're get we're gathering more data, um, you know that may introduce new new types of threats, um, uh, and 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 that data may may take on new value. Um, the the area that I think is is probably the most immediate though is people who have implanted medical devices. I think we've learned over the last five years, in particular, that. Devices like pacemakers, some of these implantable devices, and other medical devices uh, have notoriously poor security, and it's not hard for someone to. Uh, it's it's a lot easier than one would hope for uh, someone to gain access to uh, an individual's pacemaker who's not a cardiologist. Um, so I think that about all of the immediate security risks, uh, you know. Uh, Securing uh, life critical and life supporting wearable medical devices that are either implanted or worn on the body, uh, I think provides the most immediate risk uh, to human life and safety. Um, you know, and I think the, the other risks in terms of, you know, if, if, if a hacker did get access to uh, someone's uh, Fitbit account, what would they really be able to do with that? You know, I, I haven't really seen yet a compelling story about. Uh, uh, why that is um, uh, the, 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 the nature of the value of that data. But at the same time, companies like uh, Fitbit you know, have gone through the HIPAA approval process, which requires them so, such that Fitbit data can be used in, in a healthcare context, um, which requires that Fitbit take certain steps from a, a, a policy and security perspective in the way they handle data and the way they store it and all of the policies they have for their employees and things like that. Um, privacy, on the other hand, I think is, is a much more immediate concern, particularly when uh, we talked about the case of Target, for example, if, if your employer buys a Fitbit for you through an employee wellness portal to the data from that, uh, if it's just step data, yeah, they may say, okay, you know, uh, so-and-so hasn't been walking very much. But as soon as we start getting into vital signs, um, you know, the, the question becomes, is your employer using that data to make decisions that are in your best interest or their best interest? You know, because they're not always aligned. And it raises a lot of sort of thorny ethical questions about, uh, you know, what happens if your employer detects that, um, you know, you have certain lifestyle patterns. Uh, you know, you're, you, you went out and got uh, very drunk on a Saturday night and it, it's, your, your vitals are all out of whack on Sunday and your employer has access to that. You know, what does that mean about your privacy? Uh, so I think there, there's a more immediate set of questions there about uh, not necessarily who owns and who controls the data, but uh, are the decisions that are being made with that data in the best interest of the person who is wearing the wearable device or not? Right. And that is where a lot of people are saying, you know, maybe I'll just opt out of this program and pay the hundred bucks a month that, I, you know, my company is saving on me uh, because a lot of these programs are becoming opt out and you're, op you're opted in by default unless you're willing to pay the difference that that company is saving on their health insurance by having you on, 
you know, wear a Fitbit or a, you know, another activity tracker. Very true, very true. And and these security challenges are very, very complex. We won't be able to address all different variables and all different uh, categories of risk that emerges in, you know, because of these uh, variable uh, security and variable industry. And the, the whole variable ecosystem is so complex that to, for us to be able to address all those different areas in one hour is impossible. So let's, uh, we have only a few minutes left. So let's talk about your organization, Path Collaborative. It seems you're actively advising or consulting uh, organizations as far as, you know, their uh, initiatives on variables or, you know, strategic uh, consulting that you are doing. What, based on your observation, what challenges you see the organizations facing and what challenges you as an organization are, are facing because of all this uh, complexity that is out there on variables mm -hmm. and what are the concerns that you have? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, the biggest problem that, that, that a lot of the companies that we work with sort of face is, is really trying to figure out where the next opportunities are. Now that we've seen this sort of flash in the pan of activity tracking and, and smartwatches, uh, and we've seen the market c contracting a little bit, a lot of companies are really trying to figure out what their play is. What's, what's you know, what's, you know, where, where can they, um, uh, create a meaningful benefit for for their their customers. Uh, how can they take what they have and combine it with what else is out there in the industry? The thing that's exciting about this space is the nature of the opportunity changes quite a bit, right? You know, so so uh, the the rate of technological progress is so high right now in terms of not only the component technology but the algorithms and the materials and the supply chain and. Um, the data that's available in the APIs and things like that, that uh, it's a constantly changing landscape. And, and, and it's, it's also difficult for companies to sort of keep up with, you know, what is the state of the art? Because maybe they took a look at the space a year ago and didn't realize that, a lot, that certain things have changed and there's now a, a significant opportunity for them now. Uh, and so, so I think it's this, you know, trying to figure out where the space is going, where the opportunities are, and trying to keep up with the rapid pace of development here in a way that, in a sort of a cost-effective way, is, is sort of like the biggest challenge. What, what, what we do, uh, you know, there are a lot of sort of general purpose consulting shops out that, that are big, that have, have you know, uh, large armies of, of, of people. Uh, this, the collaborative that we have is a group of industry experts that um, you know that I've known and worked with for quite a while. That really kind of cover a lot of the key checkboxes that uh, you need to think about when you're building wearable technology or when you're building products that are designed to sort of improve human performance or human health or wellness. You know, behavioral science, neurology, um, product management, product strategy, advertising, uh, um, coaching, AI. Uh, we, it, our group is sort of a curated team of, of folks who, who kind of self-assemble for projects and bring very deep domain expertise and a lot of experience to those problems. So, you know, I, I like to believe that we kind of help our clients get a lot sort of deeper insight than all purpose uh, consulting shop and, and find opportunities that are a little bit more creative and insightful than, uh, you know, what may seem to be uh, a lot of not very exciting things that, that, that may appear on the surface. So that's sort of in a nutshell of, of who we are. We're kind of based, you know, we're, we're spread across the U.S., but uh, a, a lot of us are here in Boston, which is sort of a nice healthcare hub. Uh, we've got a presence in the West Coast and down in Texas. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's us. That's great. That's very timely initiative and very timely, you know, uh, effort that is required. Uh, as because uh, you know, not everyone, not all our organizations don't have that many resources that can focus on getting that timely knowledge. So organizations like yours, you know, uh, can fill that gap. But now, last question is: What would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners, especially the young students everywhere across nations? who are aspiring to be innovators and want to innovate into wireless technology variable space, what would you like to tell them based on the experience you have and based on what you have seen? I, I love this question. Uh, you know, I would say that uh, one is that um, we are, we've, we've 
only really touched one to two percent of the possible the potential here, and that the remaining uh, white space that is has really yet to be discovered is going to be opened up by creative thinkers who are able to take disparate pieces of technology and, and, and things like that and bring them together to solve meaningful problems in ways that other people haven't thought of yet. And I, you know, I often see the pattern I see is that that creative synthesis of, of product concepts isn't being done by well-established large companies. It's being done by young startups, people who uh, have not already been taught to think about the world or think about system architecture or product architecture a certain way. And that I think it is this group that will herald the next, you know, the next waves of innovation in the space. Uh, so, um, you know, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, it is a very capital intensive space. Uh, it's hard to, the challenges we've talked about, but, you know, people who have, have creativity and the ability to, to build partnerships uh, in this industry, I think are going to be the most transformative players. So, uh, yes. Have at it, I'd say. <laughs> the, the world, you know, it's uh, the world is your oyster. I think that there's so much potential. Yes, very true. There is so much potential all across nations. So, thank you so much, Dan, for participating in Risk Round today. My pleasure. We, appre we appreciate your thoughtful insight on the future of wireless technology, that is variables, and our global viewers and listeners will benefit tremendously from the information you provided on variables and its future. And even if a single individual or entity can come up with an idea to innovate and bring more functionality to variables in a secured manner and also make variables more affordable, accessible, effective, based on the discussion we had today, this risk round of dialogue has been of service. And we thank you for that. Thank you. So as we move from an age where technology used to be on our desk, then it went into our pockets. We are entering an exciting new age where technology will not only be cleverly displayed on human bodies, but will one day even be merged within the you know, human body. And it, that makes it so transformational. And it is important that we evaluate what does this mean for individuals and entities across nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia? What impact does it have? And what security risk does it bring to us? Risk groups, cybersecurity, geosecurity, and space security risk research centers are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIO, ANCGS, that means uh, cyberspace, geospace, and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace, they work together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. It is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if you build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risk together. For more information on the risk roundups, to other risk roundup videos or hear the risk roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashree Pandya, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.